Russia's invasion of Ukraine has gone spectacularly wrong. So much so that the Russian leadership is scaling back its war plan. After having ruined its campaign to take Kiev, Russian forces are now shifting focus to the south and the east. By doing so, Russia is getting ready to make its most dangerous move yet, seizing the Ukrainian coastline. The objective is to create a land bridge between Crimea and Donbass, join with Transnistria, cut off Ukraine from the sea and capture the port city of Odessa as a consolation prize. It's a strategy that will come with heavy cost. Russia will be pushing its supply chains to the limit. And even if the logistics hold, it's unclear whether Russia has the reinforcements, equipment and morale to push across southern Ukraine. The scale and complexity of such a campaign hasn't been seen since World War II, and the Russians have not trained for such operations. High casualties are to be expected. But if it works, if Russia manages to turn Ukraine into a landlocked state, the consequences would be profound. So let's talk about Russia's plan B, because armed conflict is all about how one handles plan B. Today's video is sponsored by Masterworks. Amid chaos, there is also opportunity. The global fintech market is expected to grow by 20% over the next 4 years. There's a ton of innovation in this space. Even JP Morgan recognizes the opportunities of alternative assets. It's no longer optional, but essential. My personal favorite fintech platform is Masterworks. It offers a unique asset, fine art. The ultra-rich have been using fine art as a means to store wealth. Today, that same asset class is accessible to retail investors thanks to Masterworks, which lets you become a stakeholder in multi-million dollar artworks without needing millions yourself. Masterworks sent me the stats. Most of the traffic going from Caspian Report to Masterworks has invested in the paintings of Banksy, Picasso and Basquiat. And each of these paintings has sold with over 30% net internal rate of return to their investors. Now, past performance is no guarantee of future results, but 30% is pretty impressive. If you want to join other Caspian Report subscribers, use the link in the description to skip the waiting list and get started on Masterworks. Russia has bitten off more than it can chew. 60 days into the war and its plan A has officially been cancelled. Technically, the Russian military command called the first phase a roaring success and claimed Kiev was never the real objective. The Russian strategy was to bottle up Ukrainian forces in the north, leaving the south and the east without reinforcements. According to the Russians, the Kiev campaign was a distraction. Frankly, that is nonsense. The war crimes in Bucha and Mariupol and the sinking of the Moskva flagship were not part of the plan. Russia is changing its war goals because the takeover of Kiev has failed. But this doesn't mean the end of the fight is near, far from it. As recently as April 25, Putin said it was not the right time to meet Zelensky. Which means that the Russians believe they can still capture more territory before seizing hostilities. After retreating from the Kiev campaign, Putin can only save face by bringing home a consolation prize. Ukraine's warm water ports along the Black Sea coast, particularly Odessa, would do just fine. Since switching to the second phase of the war, Moscow has tuned its informational messaging. Russian MP Leonid Babashev said that Russia would aim to place Zaporozhnya, Mikhailov and Odessa under its control. He also called for a landlocked Ukraine and the secession of Odessa to Russia. This may seem blatant, but it's not an isolated view. Russian MP Mikhail Sheremet said that Crimea and southern Ukraine should unite into a single federal district of Russia. Statements like these are dime a dozen, 
but the biggest revelation came from the deputy commander of the Russian Central Military District, Rustam Minikayev, who is one of Russia's top generals. Minikayev stated that the objective of the second phase of this special operation is to gain complete control over the Donbas region and all of southern Ukraine, creating a land bridge to Crimea and the separatist region of Transnistria, which belongs to Moldova and has a significant Russian peacekeeping force. Much of Minikayev's statement is just a rehash of the situation as it is. Russian control over the entire Donbas region was a fairly obvious observation since the start of the war, and creating a land bridge between Crimea and Russia is just a restatement of the current reality. Russia already controls big chunks of southern Ukraine, from Kherson to Mariupol to Donbas, so nothing special here. But Minikayev's statement on seizing all of southern Ukraine is quite controversial because it implies a strategy to move all the way up to Odessa, Mikhailov and Transnistria, leaving Ukraine completely cut off from the Black Sea. Сьогодні з посиланням на російських військових була розповсюджена новина про те, що начебто їхнім завданням зараз є встановлення контролю над півднем України і вихід до кордону Молдови. Russia's new war plan is perhaps its most dangerous move yet. What exactly Russia intends to do with all this territory is up for debate. Usually in conflict and diplomacy, territory is used as a bargaining chip to secure political concessions. Putin may ask Zelensky to restrict Ukraine's foreign policy and armed forces in return for some of its territories. If that doesn't work, Russia could organize popular referendums and create new separatist entities on Ukrainian soil. It would be the same trick they used in Crimea, Donetsk, Luhansk, but also in Transnistria, Karabakh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Each of these separatist regions has a different story, but each also has a Russian military presence. In a way, these proxy pseudo-states are like different branches or twigs of the same tree. They give Russia influence over the parent nations. In Kherson, Odessa, Mariupol, Mykolaiv and other Ukrainian cities in the south, Russia could organize referendums and create new pseudo-republics. At a still later date, Russia could then arrange a legal process to join these separatist regions into the Russian Federation. If southern Ukraine is annexed, Zelensky's government would be left with a rump state, and a landlocked one at that. Russia, however, would be in a position to consider an exit strategy for the war. Seizing warm water ports such as Odessa, Mariupol, Kherson, Berdyansk and Chernomorsk would serve an important PR purpose. It's something the Russian leadership can sell to its public as a victory. Ordinarily, warm water ports or year-round ice-free ports are of significant geopolitical and geoeconomic value. In Ukraine, much of its vital economic activity takes place in the south by means of exports through the Black Sea. Losing Odessa to Russia would block Ukraine from an essential export path and likely alter the regional geoeconomics. In 2021, a year before the war, Poland and Ukraine signed a Memorandum of Understanding to establish a transportation corridor going between the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. The Polish port of Gdansk and the Ukrainian port of Odessa are central to the plan, with container cargo between the two ports being transported by rail. The ultimate objective is to create an intermodule corridor to provide an alternative path for Chinese trade entering Western Europe. China has been looking for a land corridor to Europe that bypasses major powers like India, Iran and Russia. The middle corridor is the answer to that call. Running from China to Kazakhstan, the route crosses the Caspian Sea to Azerbaijan and then proceeds to Georgia and Turkey where it then crosses the Black Sea to Ukraine. The Polish-Ukrainian corridor is supposed to help facilitate Chinese trade 
by speeding up the transit time from Istanbul to Gdansk to no more than four days. This alternative corridor will happen either way, but if Russia permanently takes Odessa, the corridor would likely bypass Ukraine and settle for alternative ports instead. That would deeply harm Ukrainian interests. For Russia, however, warm water ports serve a dual purpose. By controlling ports, Russia gains the ability to control the nearby seas, project power abroad, and observe maritime consensus. So, Russian interests in the Black Sea are binary, both commercial and naval. However, the commercial aspect is rendered useless since Russia is under sanctions. Biden has recently banned Russian ships from American ports. Canada already shot its ports to Russian ships and from Canadian waters. And Italy, Estonia and Bulgaria have taken similar steps. In the coming weeks, more European nations are likely to follow these precedents. So even if Russia takes all of Ukraine's ports, it wouldn't be able to make use of the geoeconomics since no one would want to trade with Russia. Meanwhile, on the naval aspect, warm water ports are the only outlets with which Russia can influence the world beyond its immediate region, since it's explicitly a land power. Russia wouldn't be much of a global power without a few warm water ports. However, here too, there are flaws in the planning. Naval ports are only as valuable as the naval forces using them and the Russian Navy is not what it used to be. Its firepower, technology and manpower is lacking. The Russian Navy is the weakest combat branch in the Russian military. Most of its vessels are outdated and Russia does not have the resources to modernize and expand its assets. Currently, Russia doesn't even have the upper hand in the Black Sea, with Turkey being a serious contender. So, the plan to seize the Ukrainian coastline wouldn't make much of a difference to the fortunes of Russia. Moscow wouldn't have much commercial or naval use for the ports owing to its international seclusion and poor economic weight. Seizing the Ukrainian coastline would, however, serve a valuable propaganda purpose. The prized city of Odessa and others like it could allow Putin to claim victory in spite of all the injuries sustained so far. The propaganda value of seizing southern Ukraine would relate to the recent near-complete capture of Mariupol. The city of Mariupol hosted the Azov Battalion, a paramilitary group in Ukraine's armed forces which boasts SS insignia. So, by taking Mariupol, Russia could claim to have defeated the Ukrainian Nazis it sought out to destroy. This narrative, defeating the Nazis from Mariupol, seizing the warm water port of Odessa and creating a land bridge going from Russia to Crimea, would fit the official story that the Kremlin has been echoing. Achieving these goals would allow the Russian state to proclaim victory and get away with it. That said, the Russian occupation of southern Ukraine would come at a heavy cost. In fact, Russia may think the better of it and just try to retain what it is currently occupying. Moscow cannot afford another humiliating failure. But if it does decide to go on, Russia would find it difficult to push all the way to Odessa since it would stretch its supply chains thinly. It also remains unclear whether or not Russia has the reinforcements, equipment and the morale to push across such a vast distance. The scale and complexity of such a push would be unseen since World War II. The Russian army has not trained for such operations. High casualties and tactical oversights are to be expected. And the possibility of using low-yield non-strategic nuclear weapons would be a distinct possibility. Still, even if Russia is successful in the south, it is difficult to imagine a military occupation of such a vast space, one teeming with a resentful population. This is not going to end the way the Russians think it is. Because while Russia has the watch, Ukrainians have the time. 
I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. We will be doing more videos on the Ukraine war. So if you haven't yet subscribed, now is a good time to do so. Just remember to click the bell icon to receive notifications. In any case, thank you for your time and soul.